Hello everyone, and welcome to Broden Plays Crusader Kings 2. Uh, this is a let's play with the uh, Reaper's Do DLC, as well as, well let's just take a look here with the content here. So we have all of this DLC going. So we have the Way of Life, the Swords, the Reaper's Do, the Old God, Sons of Abraham. Uh, we do have the Ruler Designer, we're not going to make a ruler because that disallows achievements. We also have a Legacy of Rome, um, Horse Lords, Charlemagne, and a couple of unit packs in there. Um, that's not going to change things very much, however. So let's start a single player game. Let me get rid of the Steam Overlay here. We're actually going to start in, let's see, the early Middle Ages, I believe. It started with the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the early 5th century. And the earlier part of the era saw the great Germanic and Slavic migrations across Europe, with peoples such as the Goths and Lombards settling in southern Europe. So this this would be an interesting one to play. Um, let's see. I think I'm more comfortable with the Viking Age, however, uh, because I enjoy playing as uh, let's see, Jorvik which is uh, the petty king of Jorvik it has um, king a half damn white shirt uh, which is perfect for me so let's go ahead and start that one uh, let's play and if you see the iron mode is enabled which means the achievements are enabled as well uh, which is fantastic as you can see there are a lot of different aspects that you can go ahead and turn on and off I'm going to allow everything to be standard start the game Iron Man Jorvik. No, Iron Man, let's play. Alright, that's how we're going to start this one. Uh, this game is tough. Uh, it has a very high learning curve. It is a game that uh, relies on uh, historical data. Um, and it uses that historical data to set up different uh, sessions of what what happened during those historical times, and you then actually get to act as those historical um, individuals and make an empire, pretty much. So um, this actually will give you a little bit of a synopsis here. It says, "Welcome to Crusader Kings 2." In Crusader Kings 2, you play as a succession of middle medieval rulers. Um, from, from a single dynasty. There is no set goal, but the world is filled with ambitious rivals. Secure more land to increase your power and protect your family. Uh, you cannot hold infinite amounts of land yourself. Uh, these are a couple of things that we'll get into. Um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a tutorial series as well as a Let's Play series on this game. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know all the ins and outs of the game. There are um, a vast number of different things that happen and uh, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly um, what does everything. There's a lot of numbers involved uh, and stuff like that so let's go ahead and just start the game here. Um, I'm playing a Norse Germanic King. The reason why I like to play as Jorvik is because he starts with an event of armies here and this is uh, 14,000 units of an army which in this day and age right now um, is a lot, a lot, a lot. So we will actually change this to the realms map and uh, or maybe the diplomatic anyway uh, or dynasties maybe? No, we'll do realms. Um, so this is these are the different realms here. If you zoom out, it'll it'll show you Wessex, Mercia, Jorvik, um, Scotland here. So, a couple of the things that are very nice about this game is that you start off playing as a ruler, um, but your object of the game isn't to keep that particular ruler alive. Rather, keep your dynasty alive. This is our dynasty tree right now. So, we're Half Dan, King Half Dan White Shirt. Uh, we have three sons, it looks like. We have Ragnar, Gudfrid, and Sigfrid. And uh, one thing that's nice about this game is, uh, so a lot of the things are very historically accurate. For instance, if we go to King Halfdan, there's a Wikipedia link. We can click the Wikipedia link. 
I'm not sure if the uh, yeah it's not recording it, but it actually took me to the to the Wikipedia link of who this person actually is, uh, which is very awesome. So uh, one thing that's that's nice about this game, as I was trying to say before, but got distracted, is that uh, it's more about your dynasty and not not this particular character alone. This character will probably die soon. Uh, he's 42 years old, and this game is very rough. Uh, there is intrigue, there's backstabbing, there's uh, military conquerors, there's all sorts of different things that will um, determine whether or not your character will make it. Uh, I will have to warn you at first, this game is one that uh, will be paused for a majority of the time, because a lot of decisions have to be made while the game is paused, and then the game will proceed, and, and as your actions take place, uh, you will get several uh, warnings or pop-ups that tell you exactly what has happened throughout the game and, and, and how your choices have uh, have shaped history around you, uh, which is a very fascinating aspect for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, explaining these right here. So these are the different buttons in the game. Uh, different, uh, let's say, important decisions here. So right here it says new important decisions are available. Uh, the following important decisions are available to recruit a court physician. Since we have the Reaper's Due DLC, um, uh, we can um, have outbreaks of different diseases here. Let's actually zoom out. Uh, over here on the right hand side there's an epidemics button. We can click that and see if there are any epidemics in the game. Which as of right now, uh, this dark gray means that there isn't anything. So it doesn't look like there are any epidemics, which is nice but uh, keep in mind there will be. Um, so let's go and, and do a uh, recruit a court physician. You have sent messengers and scouts out in all directions to scour the realm for skilled physicians that would be willing to take up residence in your court. Word should reach you shortly if they manage to find a suitable candidate. Hopefully they will not bring back a quack salver which I understand is like uh, basically somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing but acts like they do. So I hope I do not have to wait long. That's the only option we have on that one. Uh, sometimes those pop-up messages will pop up and you'll have two or three options to choose from. Uh, here's the, the next important decision. It says we have an unmarried heir. Uh, it will be our son. Uh, if you look in the uh, children category, it will show you the line of succession here. Uh, now that is very important for one reason, and one reason alone. The line of succession determines who you will play next if this person dies. Uh, like I said, this game is more about the dynasty and not about the characters, so as characters get killed off or as they die of natural causes, which is rare because most characters die before natural causes can take effect, uh, you will play the next character in succession. Well, depending on your laws, which if you would go over here to laws, um, the way that succession works is, is different for each, um, each playthrough. So right now we have an agnatic Gavelkind succession law, which means the titles of the ruler are divided among his children, with the oldest getting the primary title, and if the ruler has no children who can inherit, the law defaults to primogeniture. You get no prestige penalty for having unlanded sons and can have a 30% larger domain, basically is what that word is, which right here you'll see the domain size is one of three. Uh, what the domain means is how much that you can actually hold as far as land goes yourself. Uh, you can have more land than that. Uh, you will actually give land to your vassals um, in your kingdom and that will allow you to have uh, a lot more land available um, than just the three land that I can have now. Uh, so also Gavilkind is a very popular law with everyone except the oldest child. Uh, destruction of titles while under Gavilkind's succession is not allowed and only males can inherit. This game is very historically accurate, therefore it is very rude to women. So if you are sensitive to that, uh, then get the hell out because this game will uh, will definitely show you the darker side of the medieval ages, which was pretty much men rule and uh, women do not. And it's not necessarily something that I agree with today, but it is the way that it was back then. So, when we say unmarried heir, 
Siegfried here is the unmarried one, who is our uh, primary heir, which means he will actually get the kingdom of Jorvik. Um, it is nice to marry them off, arrange a marriage. Now, this pop-up will show all of the eligible bachelorettes in the realm, um, actually in the entirety of the kingdom here, and it'll show them based on basically uh, you know, you have the different religions that, that people are, you have, you know, everything, you can you can do it by name, dynasty, culture, realm, age, diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, and learning. Um, we'll actually get into that a little bit later, but one of the things I do want to talk about is inheritable traits. So, um, as we go down here, we will see things with a heart around them. For instance, this has a heart around it, and it says weak. That is an inheritable trait, which means that if um, Frisia um, and Siegfried here have a kid, there is a chance that this uh, will be inherited to uh, make the child weak. So if you are going for inheritable um, things with the heart around them, you will want to make them so they're good. Like this one's a, a stutter, which gives them less diplomacy, which isn't good. Um, doesn't look like there are any positive traits right now that are inheritable. So uh, the next thing that you can do is sort by rank. What the rank is, is uh, if you see this border right here, it shows how um, uh, basically how high up this person is on the ladder. So if you see my border is silver, uh, which means that I'm a petty king, if you will. So uh, Yulva, Yulva, I believe, um, has a, a border here, and if you look, if we go to the other rank, this is just a courtier, um, so she does not have any kind of border but the silver. So we want to, if possible, um, get the higher ranking individuals to be with us. Um, trusting. A trusting character make poor spy masters, but good friends. Another thing to note is that this character, as we will play him next, um, these scores will be our scores in the game. Right now, these are our scores, which as you can see are much higher. Um, another thing to note is that if we are married, um, the diplomacy of the state will actually, our wives' scores will be added to that as well. So it is nice to get married because then you can have your scores and your wife's scores and um, everyone else's scores in that, in that um, scenario. Now, I will probably cut down on explanation for now. Um, I will just play the game, show you how it's played, uh, and if there's anything that you have questions with or that you're stuck on or that you want me to explain, go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section below. I'd be more than happy to either address it in the comment section below or even make an entire um, video dependent on um, how popular the series is and how many comments that I get. I generally only get one to two comments. Um, very nice thing about being a small channel. Also having a uh, crappy mic to be honest with you. Um, which is something that I hope to rectify in the next month or two. Um, but one thing that is nice about that is that I read all the comments. Um, I generally respond to those that uh, have feedback for me, and uh, I can respond with the videos, because I have a lot of free time right now, um, and I can very well go into depth um, about uh, a particular aspect of the game if you, if you need that explanation. So for now, we're going to actually marry our heir off. Um, we'll actually marry him to a higher ranking person. The reason being is because uh, we generally will lose less prestige. Right now we're, we're losing 100 prestige here. Um, they will accept that, so let's go ahead and send that over. Um, and I will also get married, seeing as though I am not married. Uh, this is a priestess. Let's see if we have anything good here. Not really, and everyone kind of hates us for some reason. Because uh, of our religious differences, we are Germanic pagan. Okay, so these people will like us because they're our same religion. Uh, let's see here. We might want to marry this individual. So they will say yes. We will lose 100 prestige from marrying a Gaija, which I have no idea what that is. But let's go ahead and send that over. Um, so both me and my heir will get married. So let's move on to the next one. It's pick a character focus. This is the way of life. DLC. So um, I like to do the hunting focus. Uh, actually, no particular reason for that. I just enjoy it. 
But uh, you know what? Let's do something different. Let's do a uh, a business. That sounds fun to me. Um, King Halfdan fraternizes with burghers and merchants seeking to unravel the enigma of gold. That sounds like a, a lot of fun, actually, so we will do that as focus. Also, sp special minor trades or titles are grantable. Um, we need a designated regent. Um, so this means if we are, uh, if we get incapacitated in any way, this person will actually start ruling the realm. Um, seeing as though this guy likes us and he's a mayor, he can also lead troops. He has a uh, pretty good diplomacy. We're actually going to put him as the designated regent. Um, special title action possible. Set crown focus. What a set the crown focus do is it will uh, it will be more likely to prosper and they'll receive special events there. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we will unpause the game and play. One thing that's nice about playing with the Nords is that, as you can see here, we are we might be at war. Yes, we are at war with uh, King Ayla of Northumbria. So, um, we are getting married. We can collect a royal aid duty to pay for the ceremonies. We can say yes or no, people respect wealth. We will say that. Uh, the reason being is because we'll gain 25 prestige back when we have negative 100. So, uh, let's see. Your wisdom and mercy are legendary. I accept your suggestion that these people get married. Perfect. Alright, so we are at war with this individual right here. Um, so we will go in to their territory and start battling the hell out of them. Alright. Um, I accept your suggestion that those two people get married as well. Cool. So, uh, your spy master reports that a heretical, heretical sorcerer has been caught and jailed in the city of Skardaborg. This sorcerer has apparently healed various elements, um, afflicting the other prisoners. Although he is scheduled for execution at noon, you can pardon him and bring him into your employ. Most unorthodox, but I do need a physician. I'm going to have a sorcerer for a physician. Um, that doesn't really sound like a good idea to me, but hey, we're going to do it anyway. So, uh, Bishop Bernard, uh, a preacher in the service of King Charles II of West Francia, so basically a bishop of the Catholic Church, has arrived in Yorvik to spread the gospel of the foreign religion. He has little regard of our old faith, declaring it sinful, and he has explained in details the horrors we shall suffer in the afterlife unless we mend our ways. There are horrors to suffer in this life as well, friend. That's what I'm going to choose. We'll actually throw this guy into prison, which is fantastic. So he's in our dungeons now. So over here, an outbreak of disease in the camps outside of the walls of Durham has light has killed many of the besiegers. All right, so we are besieging this town right here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assault the holding, which will make the besiege go faster. Um, and I'll go ahead and do that again. It may go faster again, and I will do it a third time, which has completely made them ours. So we will continue on to the next area here. Um, now, a couple other things that I need to do is I need to go to our council positions and uh, start making these people do things. So I'm pausing the game. I'm going to have this guy collect taxes. Um, this guy will scheme over here, and then this guy will, uh, yeah, prophylize, proph, um, proselytize, I suppose. Um, yes, I don't use that word very often, so uh, I don't really know how to pronounce it, but that is okay. Alright, so we are just sieging this territory here. Um, again, if you have any questions about what's going on in the game, go ahead and leave a comment and I'll help you out. Uh, so, the soldiers in red are those that uh, will attack us, so if we go into their territory, we will fight them with these guys. And we will win this battle, because we have far more men than they do. Which will improve our war score. If our war score gets up to 100%, then we can um, enforce a surrender for them. Um, I am going to try and fight these guys as well. It looks like they are fighting a couple of people. Um, they are getting some reinforcements. And I'm going to march in here and provide them with my reinforcements. 
Oh, they're going to battle it out before I'm able to battle, I suppose. So, that's okay. Alright, now we're battling them. And we're going to win, for sure. Alright, so we do have a victory there. We've lost 31 men and they've lost 784. So we definitely won that one. Alright. And we are besieging this town here. Um, this red bar means how much morale that they have. If they go all the way down in morale, we automatically win the besiege. Uh, generally, I like to assault. That will make us lose more men, but the besiege happens a lot quicker, um, which sometimes is important in war because, as you see, they're trying to besiege their territories back over here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to um, stop besieging and go over there to try and fight them. We have far more men than they do, so we should be able to win this battle. We don't have very much prestige, actually. We have negative 50. It's from the marriages, but that's okay. So let's battle these people. This is the main view of the game. Um, if you're expecting high integrity graphics or anything of that nature, um, as you can see, the sprites look pretty nice. Um, but aside from that, okay, so the cook has prepared a fine meal, but the priest preached about temperance. I try to eat modestly, but the food is too good. Um, there's a 45% chance that we get gluttonous, which will give us minus two stewardship. Um, the church doesn't like it and not very much attraction. Or, I satisfy my hunger with bread and water, which we might get temperance, which uh, will actually help our character out as far as diplomacy goes, so we're going to click that one. So, there are um, a lot of choices in this game, and unless you know what the choices will do, it's hard to decide what options to choose. So, we're going to follow these individuals to continue our fights. Um, we're going to besiege this area here. Uh, we have 76% war score. Once it gets up to 100, they will surrender. Alright, there we go. So, we have captured that. We have captured that. We're at 85% war score. And that brings us up to 95%. I think if we come and battle these guys, and we win that battle, that will actually provide us with enough war score to win the entirety of the war and enforce our demands and make them surrender. So, we will do that. And they are currently besieging our main town and we can't have that because we do not allow infidels to besiege us. One thing that's nice is we are playing as Norse. Um, and the Nordic people, um, they have quite a high opinion of their religion, um, which is basically rape and pillage everything and uh, convert people to our faith for Odin, of course. So, uh, this mayor was captured in battle and is now my prisoner. Perfect. All right, so we'll go ahead and offer peace and we are enforce our demands. Ah, uh, there we go. So, the Sons of Lubrick invasion of Northern Land has ended and we have won. Perfect, so this is now your Vic. See how big it is now? Quite awesome in that sense. So, here we are. Um, we have now a lot of titles. So we've, they have formed a defensive pact opposing us. The reason why this is happening is because we are threatening. We have a 9.7% threat, um, which means we have a lot of land when we did it before. So um, a lot of people will try and take up arms against us um, if we continue to go to war. So here is um, where our demand size, domain size, and uh, giving land to our vassals will benefit us. So we have wrong types of holdings. So um, what that means is that as a petty king, we're not actually supposed to hold temples or cities uh, because we're supposed to hold um, castles and provinces. So what we need to do is we need to go over here. Uh, we need to look at um, our heirs we have this guy, um, who we actually can't give any land to. It's kind of odd, but let's go to our vassals here. So this gentleman right here has an heir. Um, what I like to do is I like to give people landed titles that have no sons, 
so that they can't actually, um, when I give them the land titles, their heirs, their sons and daughters will not actually want the titles themselves. It just makes it easier once we die. So we will just give him all the cities, honestly. And then let's go back to our vassals. Um, we have a count, we have a mayor, we have a bishop. We will actually give the bishop all of the temples. And that actually will improve, uh, right now we have a negative 25 opinion, or they have a negative 25 opinion of us. If we go back here now, they have a 15 opinion of us because we've granted them um, different areas. And he has a 100 opinion of us because um, we've granted him a lot of um, things as well. So it looks like people are uh, joining the defensive pact against us, which is okay. That just means that for now, we probably shouldn't go to war. Uh, we still have a too big of a domain. Um, we have one other, uh, one more. Um, this guy's a count, so we will give him a, a landed title. We have one too many lands. We'll give him that one, because that's what we just inherited. So let's do that. And then we go to vassals, and his opinion of us is now 56. So as you can see, their opinions improve based on uh, how much land we give them, and based on a lot of other traits as well. Um, so this person does not like us. The reason why is because we had a domain that was too big for quite some time, they're envious, and are, we are arbitrary. So they don't like us for those reasons. If you, if you click on us, you can see right here, these are our traits. We're a skilled tactician, we are a viking, um, we are a hunter, we're ambitious, we are wroth, we are cruel, and zealous. <coughs> so the defensive pact opposing this individual has been disbanded. So a king, a new realm, King Almos of Hungary has decided to abandon nomadic life and settle down in Hungary with his followers, making it a new homeland for the Hungarian people. Interesting. I don't really know why that's important for me, because I'm not them at all. So the reason why I enjoy playing as a character who is Nordic is because the lands around us, in Crusader Kings 2 there's something called a Kossa's Belly, which means um, we have to have Kossa or Kossa's Belly to attack another nation, um, which definitely makes sense, especially considering, let's pause again for now, especially considering the fact that even these days with the UN we have to have Kossa for, you know, um, going into a country and destroying them. So. Um, being a Nordic character, what we can do is we can click on a, a country, we can declare war with almost anyone. We cannot declare war if we have any raised army levies. So let's go over here to the military. We do have armed, so we will we will um, dis dismiss our levies. We still have 5,000 troops, but these are actually um, what are called, I believe, uh, what kind of troops are they called? event troops, which actually don't count towards our army. They count towards an event army, which is something completely different. So if we go to uh, the military, we have dismissed our levies. So we can click on this guy and declare war, I think. No, because he's not independent, so we would have to declare war on his siege. Uh, we, just, we just came into troops with them. So if we were declared war, we would break the truce, and it would cost us 500 prestige. I'm not willing to do that, and it would lower all Christian rulers' opinion of us by negative by 25. So we don't want that. Um, this guy has this guy as a liege. I don't think we've gone to war with them before, and we have not. So I will show you um, what's nice about being Nordic. Uh, so we can do a conquest. Pagans and nomads can conquer single border country counties without specific reasons. Norse pagans can also take any coastal county. So we will conquest Chester um, because we're Nordic and we can. So we will do that. We will click um, the play button and we will march our 5,000 troops into Chester to obliterate them. Wait, did I actually declare war? Yeah, yeah, we're at war. Interesting. 
Generally, when you declare war, there we go. I was going to say, generally, when you declare war, they send their troops out. Um, so we will actually raise our vassal levies, which gives us another 400 men. We will move them over here as well. Uh, this red bar right here is the morale of the army. As you can see, we have a full morale with this army, but no morale with this army. Um, once two armies are combined, we can merge the selected units, which turns them into one big army. Uh, which is actually very, very good to do if your armies, um, one of them has really low morale, one has high morale, because it will even out the morale of the two. So we will actually make our way to this place to uh, destroy this army. And the reason being is because I believe it is their main fighting force. So if we uh, totally obliterate them, then we get a lot of war score, and they don't have a lot of armies left. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, victory. We've lost 200 men. They've lost 1,000. So we definitely won that one. Um, here, there's 500 men. We will go ahead and siege this town. We have a 35% war score at this point. 41%. And 45%. So we'll go back to Chester, which is the town that we're actually, or sorry, the country, I believe, the province, whatever you want to call it, that we're trying to conquer. Uh, we have some truces expiring, which is completely fine with me. Um, when the game starts, you will have truces and you will have certain things that had happened and transpired before you actually got a hold of your character because it's um, historically accurate. So. Let's kill the defenders here. There we go. Now that we've done that, we have a 73% war score. Again, we have to have that up to 100 to uh, to actually win the war. Although 69% is like the perfect percent. I wish we can win the war with a 69% war score. It would make more sense for me, but whatever. After this war, oh cool, we've captured somebody and they're now our prisoner. Perfect. After this war, we'll probably end this episode. Um, and one thing that I would like to show you in a in a future episode is what we do with if we go to our intrigue, what we're going to do with all these delicious prisoners that we have uh, captured in our wars and our conquests of different countries. There is something really nice to do when you are a pagan. I will just leave it at that for now. There we go. We have taken control. We have a 100% war score, so click, click the portrait, offer peace, enforce demands. Which means that we will gain the county of Chester. I guess it's called county, huh? And then uh, we will gain the bishopric, and we will gain a city. We'll also win um, a 100 prestige from the war contribution, and get 50 piety from war contribution which is because we are a pagan, we get something called piety, which is actually very important to have um, for a religious war. So let's go ahead and click yes. And then we have usurped the title of the city of Macclesfield, and then the temple, and also the county of Chester from that guy. Um, King Hafton of Yorvik has won the war. Perfect, we'll bring this guy back over to Yorvik. Again, we have seven out of four domain size. So, um, and we have the wrong holding, so we need to go back to our vassals and give some more vassals some more land. This guy likes us 54. Let's see if we can get him to 100. We will give him a temple. We will give him a city. Um, one title can be created, which is the Duchy of Lancaster. Um, let's create that, actually. So. Creating this title will give you 200 prestige and cost you 159 gold. Let's do it. Boom. We now have a duchy. We have created the title Jarldom of Lancaster. So we now have a Jarldom, which is a lot of different counties together. Um, what that does is it adds the Jarldom as a, uh, as a title here. So we have counties, we have Jarldoms, and now we have a petty kingdom as well. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and grant this guy a county of Chester, and then there we go. We have all of our uh, different counties accounted for with our different vassals. Um, 
I will actually lower the speed here. You can increase and lower the speed with the plus and minus on the numpad. Uh, one thing that I like to do whenever I go to war and then end the war is get our get our troops back into our main county um, and then go over to military and dismiss them. What that does is it allows them to uh, in increase um, the number of, of armies they can have. So they can have 565 right now, it's only 291. The reason why I raised my vassal levies and not mine is because when we raise them, we don't have to cost any gold. If I raise mine, then it would cost us gold each month. Right now, we are making 4.3 gold a month. So if we raise them, I'll just show you real quick, it would cost us 7.39 gold a month, so we'd be losing some gold a month. Um, that's actually where we will end it. Uh, the Vargarian Guard. Varagian Guard, sorry. Um, the king of Greeks is distraught over the poor metal of his countrymen, so knowing well our skill in battle, he has decided to form a bodyguard consisting solely of Norse warriors. Those who serve him in the great city of Meglargrad are generously rewarded, and even now many of our young men eager for riches and adventure have departed for Greece to pick up his banner. I will say, may they find the excitement they yearn, and that guard is now formed. We will go ahead and save the game, since in an Iron Man mode we can only save in one slot, and once we quit the game it will save automatically. Thank you guys so much for joining me today, I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time.